All right, everybody, welcome back to the Validated Virtual Conference, full dedicated to exploring the science of validation, efficiency, and sterile processing. I'm Brett Norton from Beyond Clean, and I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for joining us today. It's been a great day of candid discussions and eye-opening ideas and ways to improve sterile processing. So we really do appreciate you, and thanks again for joining us. For those of you anxiously awaiting your CE credits, after viewing all of today's sessions, you'll have access to the full conference survey and will be able to download your CE certificate. So I know we've had a couple of questions on that. It comes at the end. You'll be able to do that, all of that at the end. Joining us next is Donald Tuminelli, Senior Technical, Technical Manager of Client Services at High Power Validation and Testing Labs. With over 19 years in the medical device industry, validating both re reusable and single use devices, Don is considered to be a subject matter expert in the field of validation testing. He is also a corporate member of ARN, Isham, and Amy. Donald is also a committee member on over 10 ISO, ANSI, and Amy standards. Have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes of the validation process for the latest healthcare sterilizer for FDA approval? Don is here and he'll take us on a never before seen look into the validation process of healthcare sterilizers. What are the different sterilizer systems available in healthcare? What standards must be met in order to receive FDA approval? The answers to these critical questions and more will be answered during this thought-provoking session. So without further ado, let's welcome Don. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're enjoying your Friday. I know I am. Um, this has been a wonderful event. Um, and I think it's a great way to end the week. Uh, a lot of good discussions earlier today. We've had some of our staff here at High Power Labs uh, tuning in as well. They seem to be enjoying it and um, definitely a hard act to follow on some of those uh, earlier discussions. So thanks to Brett and the whole Beyond Clean team for having me here today. I'm excited to uh, teach you a little bit about uh, validating sterilizers, something you probably didn't think much about, um, but I hope you enjoy it. And of course, at the end, if you have any questions, um, we'll have some time for that and I'd love to answer those for you. Um, once again, thank you all for joining. And um, I'm about to get in my presentation. Uh, we spent a little bit of our day here <laughs> with our Halloween party and stake out here at High Power. It's our annual party. So uh, like I said, it's been a great day and I'm excited to have you guys on board for this uh, last part of the day. Um, Let's get started here. <clears throat> so if a lot of you don't know, uh, High Power Validation Labs is a contract testing laboratory. Uh, we've been validating medical devices for uh, well over 30 years. Um, but what a lot of people don't know about us is we validated sterilizers. That was a big part of what we've done, okay? Um, our number one study ever in the late 80s was a sterilizer. So that's really how we got our start. And then the medical devices uh, followed after that. We have about uh, 40 people here in Rochester, New York, uh, who on our team, um, a full laboratory. Um, and um, as you'll see, uh, there's lots of different types of sterilizers out there. Um, the most important thing I wanna point out today is that sterilizers are medical devices if they are marketed to a healthcare facility. So they are subject to FDA approval as a class two medical device. Very important to understand that. Um, here are some of the objectives that we want you to make sure you take home today. Um, one is we're gonna explain the different types of sterilization systems out there in healthcare. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of them already. You probably have them in your facilities, which is great but there might be some today that you've never seen before or heard of. We're also gonna talk about the standards that are associated with validating sterilizers, okay? So different types of steri sterilizers um, do have um, ISO, AMI, ANSI standards that dictate the performance requirements for those. Um, we're gonna talk about the common uses in healthcare 
and then the validation test plans and the test batteries that go behind validating a sterilizer before the FDA uh, gives that blessing for it to be sold in the United States, okay? All right, <clears throat> so of course, with any industry and profession, there's acronyms, and here are a few that everyone <laughs> might wanna take a look at here. Most of you probably heard of AMI, Association for the Advanced Automatic Instrumentation. Um, IUSS is important because that is a claim that you would uh, have to um, file for when you're filing um, for your sterilizer clearance. IFU, I think we learned that earlier today. I think in the very first session, we learned quite a bit about IFUs. That was a great presentation. Um, and then there's also DFU, okay? IFU seems to be a little more um, prominent here, but sometimes you'll still see uh, DFUs out there and those are directions for use. MDM is the medical device manufacturer. So in this particular presentation, the medical device manufacturer will be the sterilizer manufacturer, okay? Whoever uh, is getting their sterilizer cleared, okay? Uh, TIR, technical information report. MPI, maintenance of package integrity. Many of you uh, look at this as shelf life, okay? Um, for a uh, sterile product. ETO, ethylene oxide, VHP, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, and SAL, sterility assurance level. Okay, so some of those you'll see today as we go through the slides. Okay, now here's some important standards. Uh, you may have heard of some of these, you may not, but these are the performance requirement standards that the sterilizer companies would have to conform to. Uh, to get their sterilizer cleared. So for hospital sterilizers, almost every hospital um, across uh, the United States probably has a steam sterilizer. Amy ST8 is the performance requirement standard that would be used to help validate that particular type of sterilizer. Um, the next one down, tabletop sterilizers. Uh, those most likely not in a big healthcare facility, but smaller maybe ambulatory care facilities, um, dental offices for sure, um, OBGYNs and small office-based settings may have these tabletop sterilizers. Okay, very, very popular and quite a few of those out there. Next one down is Amy ST24, automatic general purpose ETO sterilizers. <laughs> and a lot of you might be saying right now, geez, I thought ETO was pretty much uh, done and, and gone out of healthcare. But the, unfortunately there, there still does remain uh, some ETO sterilizers that are out there, okay? So we still do validations for them, and they still are, uh, there still are a number of medical devices that are in circulation that require ethylene oxide steril sterilization. Um, either they haven't been revalidated for another modality, or they just can't be revalidated for another modality, and ETO is the only thing that makes sense. Uh, I think there may be a little bit of a um, renaissance as well in regards to that. Unfortunately, I won't, I won't talk too much more about that today, but uh, there does seem to be a need for it. Next one down, dry heat sterilizers. A lot of you may or may not have heard of a dry heat sterilizer, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The uh, standard is ST40. That is actually um, being revised as we speak. The next one down isn't technically a standard. It's the guidance on pre-market notification for sterilizers intended for use in healthcare. And that is an FDA document, okay? And if you can see, it is dated 1993. It, you know, it seems antiquated when you look at that date right there, but it is still in effect. And the FDA still does use that today um, for clearing quite a few sterilizers. And the last one down, uh, not really uh, big in the U.S., but it can be used um, for other sterilizers. Uh, it is an EN standard. EN stands for, uh, it's a European uh, standard, so it's used um, in Europe. But there are a few sections in there that the FDA does recognize. So I thought that was worthwhile putting that in there. So that's EN-285. <clears throat> okay. So why is it important for a sterilizer, okay, to be validated? Um, what, like I said earlier, sterilizers are class two medical devices, okay? 
um, according to the FDA. It, they fall under different product codes depending on which type of sterilization process you're clearing. As you can see, the FLE, FRG, FLF, MLR, okay? Um, what I didn't talk about earlier was another term called modality. I may use that as we move forward here, but think of it this way. A modality could be steam. So steam is a modality of sterilization. Ethylene oxide is a modality of sterilization. Um, dry heat's a modality of sterilization. And vaporized hydrogen peroxide, okay? So that word modality, get used to that. Um, all sterilizers cleared for use in healthcare must achieve a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six, okay? In other words, one in a million chance of a non-sterile item. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, and then of course, the consequences of a non-sterile item during surgery can be life-threatening. So that's why this is very important that these sterilizers are not only validated, but that they do have that mark of approval from the FDA to be used in healthcare clinically. And of course, the last one, which some of you are very familiar with, and God forbid uh, you ever have this happen again, but uh, the consequences of load recalls, okay, for non-sterile items. We all know those are costly. And hopefully these validations and the FDA approval will minimize that for you and your, your facility. Okay, so here, there's a lot of choices, okay? Like I said earlier, um, I'll use the word modality again. Um, as you can see the listing of different types of modalities that are available in healthcare today. Steam, steam is a high temperature sterilization process. Like I said, almost every facility across the country has some type of steam sterilizer. It is what we call the process of choice when it comes to sterilization. Dry heat, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It is also a high temperature process. It can, some of these dry heat sterilizers can get up to 160 Celsius or hotter. You think of it as um, just uh, your oven at home basically is dry heat. Ethylene oxide, that's a low temperature process, okay? Vaporized hydrogen peroxide, that's also a low temperature process. Parasitic acid, another low temperature process. And then of course um, we have the combination of VHP and ozone, which some of you may know as the Sterizone system. Okay, now we're gonna get into some little particulars of each modality. So here we go, the dry heat modality. Uh, many of you wonder what dry heat's used for. Uh, like I said earlier, it's like an oven. Think of your oven at home. All, it's basically time and temperature, okay? Um, it's dry heat because there's no humidity in there and it's just basically heated air. There's a couple different types of dry heat sterilizers out there. One is convection where heat just rises and falls. And then there's forced air, which is no more different than um, maybe some of you have at home with um, fans in your oven, which actually circulates um, the air around. That's kind of how some of these forced air work. Um, they circulate the uh, heated air around to get better penetration throughout the chamber. Um, they do have limitations. <clears throat> uh, one of those is the high temperature, of course. If you have devices that can't withstand high temperature, well, dry heat is out of the question and you would have to look for a low temperature process. Uh, these are very popular in dental and orthodontics office. Um, they, they really like them in the orthodontics offices because a lot of their tools in there have carbide tips on there. And of course, uh, steam, which is another big modality that's used in dental offices, um, does not do very well on these orthodontic devices with carbide. So dry heat seems to be um, the process of choice for, for that types of those types of settings. It's also easy to install. It's basically just a plug, plug it in the wall and you're good to go. There's no water you have to have. Um, so basically, you just have to have that energy source. Next uh, reason is they're good for sterilizing powders and talcs. It's very possible that some healthcare facilities out there may have a need for doing that, okay, for certain procedures that are done. There may be some powders or talcs that you have to sterilize, and the only way to really do that is dry heat. So you may find a dry heat sterilizer in your facility. I think the last thing is it is very inexpensive. Okay, um, not to not to uh, 
not dry heat at all, but they do look, some of them do look like toaster ovens <laughs> that you would see in a dorm room. Uh, but they are FDA cleared, so they do the job, uh, but they're that simple, okay? Let's move on from dry heat. Ethylene oxide. All right. So like I said, ethylene oxide's still around today in healthcare facilities. Uh, typically found in hospitals, they're larger units with much more utilities uh, to install. So you're not gonna find them in smaller office-based settings. In today's world, we use 100% ethylene oxide gas. Uh, mixtures are no longer uh, allowed. <clears throat> and they usually use cartridges as opposed to tanks. However, I do believe there still are systems out there with tanks um, that feed the gas into the chamber. Um, the ethylene oxide sterilization cycle is based on time, temperature, concentration, and humidity. The gas is carcinogenic. <clears throat> we all, those who have worked with it know that. Um, they have long cycle times. That is um, one thing with uh, ethylene oxide uh, that makes other modalities look a little more palatable. Ethylene oxide sterilization um, could have high absorption rates for certain materials. And then at the end of the cycle, you usually do have aeration times, which could take 8 to 12 hours. Uh, there's a few very common 100% ETO cycles um, on the market today. Uh, I listed those here. 883 milligrams, 759, and then there's a range 725 to 735. Now, there are others out there that are just emerging. Um, a new company, Anderson, um, is really um, doing a great job getting into the market with a new technology of an oxide stuff. If for some reason you are considering, you may want to look at them, and I believe um, 3M as well. Steam, of course, the process of choice, okay? Oldest known sterilization process. Um, we believe it's been around since the uh, late 1800s. Um, there was one company actually right here in Rochester, New York, <clears throat> Wilmot Castle Company, now known as Genninga, who was one of the pioneers in steam sterilization. Uh, uh, the sterilization process is only based on time, temperature, and sterile contact, okay? It is under pressure, as you all know. Uh, one of its limitations is it can be um, uh, damaging to devices that can't withstand high heat. Some materials, like anodization, don't do very well in the steam process. But overall, most materials are compatible. Different types of steam cycles you're going to find out there. Gravity, though, which is fewer and far between every day, I would have to say. Uh, but there are still gravity cycles that are being used every day in hospitals. The most popular that everyone here is probably familiar with is what we call dynamic air removal, okay? Now, dynamic air removal <clears throat> is kind of an umbrella term used for a couple different processes. One of them is called steam flush pressure pulse, okay? Now, it's similar to pre-vacuum. It pulses, it just pulses with positive pressure, okay? And then pre-vacuum pulses with negative pressure. So it goes below, so we call it sub-atmospheric pulsing, okay? So both are considered dynamic air removal, <clears throat> but we can break those down into pre-vac and steam flush pressure pulse. Vaporized hydrogen peroxide, <clears throat> very popular today. I would say probably the second most popular sterilization modality found in hospitals today. Right there with steam, you'll find these other hydroperoxide sterilizers. Some of them you're probably familiar with, <clears throat> such as the steroid system, the steroid V-Pro, and now we have um, the Sterizone. So once again, uh, they use vaporized hydroperoxide in the gas form. They're based on time <clears throat> concentration and that's the concentration of the peroxide as it injects into the chamber. They're considered environmentally friendly. You have one utility pretty much, and that's the plug uh, that plugs in the wall. Everything else is pretty much self-contained. They've been very popular over the last 20 years, and they've done a good job displacing ETL. 
they can be degrading to some polymers, adhesives and epoxies. So no modality is perfect. We all know that. Um, one limitation is paper products. <clears throat> no paper products in the hydroperoxide systems. <laughs> Each manufacturer has specific cycles and specific parameters. And when you clear these to the FDA, you clear the sterilizer for the cycles and you clear them for the parameters for each one. One type of hydroperoxide sterilizer is the steroid system. So this one, I just wanted to point these out. There's, there's a few out there and we're gonna go through the ins and outs of each of them. The steroid system uses, uh, has three different models on the market, the 100S, the NX, and the 100NX. They use a gas plasma technology. The plasma is an RF frequency um, that emits during the cycle <clears throat> and gives it a very uh, unique um, system. It uses 59% peroxide. <clears throat> the NX technology concentrates the peroxide in the chamber to roughly 90% or greater. The cycles have two separate injections of peroxide per cycle. Okay, another type of uh, process out there that many of you may have is the Steris B Pro. There are a number of different ones out there. There's the B Pro Plus, the B Pro Max, the VPRO Max 2, the S2, and the VPRO 60. We at High Power do have all of these models here on site, as well as all the steroids. They use 59% peroxide as well. There is no plasma associated with the steroid systems. They have four in injections per cycle. There are There is one or two cycles maybe that has two injections, but the majority of them do have four injections per cycle. And once again, no plasma, okay? Sorry, that was a double slide there, folks. I do apologize for that. I noticed that earlier today. So we'll just skip this one. Stereolucent is another company who has a 510K. <clears throat> Most of you may not have heard of them. Their model is the HC80TT. It has 59% peroxide and two separate injections of peroxide per cycle. Once again, no plasma. This unit is a little smaller, almost like a little tabletop version, similar to um, the Stared NX and similar to the uh, Stared Pro 60. All right, <clears throat> so let's get into what goes into uh, validating a sterilizer. So when you're val when you're when you're when you're as a medical device manufacturer, when you're filing for a new sterilizer 510K. The manufacturer cannot just clear the sterilizer on its own, okay? So what that means is that you have to have a full package, okay? Um, the FDA is not going to allow just the sterilizer to get on the market because if you had just the sterilizer on the market, you would have nothing to monitor it, okay? So how would you do your sterility assurance and load releases? Well. The answer is a BI and a CI and a packaging system at a, at, the, at a minimum. So to get your sterilizer cleared, you also have to have a BI, a CI, and a packaging system. Now your packaging system could be a pouch, could be a wrap, could be a rigid container. Any of those are okay as long as you have one to mark it with your device and clear. Now. It's not just the sterilizer that needs the 510K, it's also the BI, the CI, and the packaging system. So in essence here, you're looking at multiple 510Ks. <clears throat> so these projects are not small, okay? These are very large projects that can take upwards of one, two, possibly three years to get through all the validation testing required to get your model sterilizer on the market. Um, the one thing you have to do as well, when you're filing for a 510K for a sterilizer, you have to have a predicate device. What that means is you have to uh, demonstrate equivalency for your sterilizer that you're clearing up against a sterilizer that's already been cleared. So you have to define what that predicate device is. 
Now, if you have, if you as a manufacturer materializer have clearance already for another model, you can use your own device, your own sterilizer as a predicate device, or you can use competitors. Okay, so the 510K process is all about showing equivalency <clears throat> to what's already on the market. Some of the claims that you need to validate a sterilizer are maximum load weight. So what that means is when you're validating a sterilizer, you have to claim what that is, okay? Most of the time it's pounds or some type of weight in that essence. Other times it could technically be load based on maybe a, a certain type of uh, complex device, such as let's just say an endoscope or something like that. It is possible that you could just claim a single endoscope or maybe two endoscopes per cycle. Um, another claim is your cycle description and your phases. Okay, so those those are defined <clears throat> and those are cleared along with your sterilizer. Now, this is important, okay, because a lot of you may not know this, or you may know this, but the cycles are what FDA is clearing, okay? Those cycles are what we're validating. And a lot of you may know this, but uh, for steam sterilizers, some of those cycle parameters are locked. You cannot change those, and that's the reason right there. Those cycle parameters are validated and cleared by the FDA, and they're not to be tampered with, okay? Um, so these preloaded, pre-programmed, pre-validated cycles are important. <clears throat> and anything outside of those, when they're changed, could void uh, the phytic game. The next bullet down has to do with lumens, OK? Hopefully, we all know what lumens are. Uh, think of channels and a scope. That is a lumen. Those claims are very important with the FDA. You must claim your minimum diameter <clears throat> and your maximum length. OK, um, you have to also claim how many lumens or how many lumen devices or how many channels are going to be claimed in your cycle. The next one down is your accessories. All your accessories have to be cleared along with your package. So, for instance, if you have racks, if you have other trays or other holding components, silicone brackets, any of that should be declared with your 510K when it's being uh, submitted to the FDA. The sterilant also has to be defined. Okay, concentrations, shelf life of the sterilant, um, injection volumes, and so on. So here are some designs of experiment. <clears throat> so for a steam sterilizer, we would use ST8 for compliance. Your sterility assurance level is going to be 10 to 6, of course, for each and every cycle claimed. You would claim your maximum loads except for IUSS, uh, immediate use ster steam sterilization, you could technically uh, just say one device in a basket, okay? So one single device in a basket could be the claim. So that's what I was getting at when I said about weight. You may not have to define the maximum weight for that type of cycle, okay? Um, but most other manufacturers, if you're doing a full load for a, you know, a terminal sterilization cycle with wrapped devices, um, then you would have to define the maximum number of wrap trays or the maximum number of weight that you're claiming for that cycle. Same goes with the lumen sizes and the quantity. Steam sterilizers, you're allowed to claim textiles claims, okay? Uh, there's still facilities out there that are validating or still processing their own um, textiles, towels, you name it, linens, sheets, so that is another claim you could make as a steam sterilizer uh, uh, manufacturer. Thermal profiles, that's a test we do in empty chambers to get your 510K. Uh, each cycle that you're claiming <clears throat> has to be um, tested for temperature distribution throughout the chamber, usually every corner and then throughout the center and the different shelves. Another big one that we've been hearing a lot about is dry time validations. You, you as a manufacturer of a steam sterilizer, you have to define what your cycle is, uh, dry time is for your cycle. Okay, those are minimum dry times. I know you can add that uh, dry times on or add time on to that, but the minimum should be defined in the user manual for the sterilization cycle. Foetic tests. If it's a dynamic air removal sterilizer, that is going to be another cycle that you have to validate and prove to the FDA uh, 
for the standard voidic test back. And then of course, there's also safety tests. A lot of other tests that you may not be aware of, such as thermal hazards uh, and, and, and other you know, pressure ratings and, and, and the vessels and the materials in the chamber. Okay. Tabletop sterilizers. <clears throat> Just to give you a little idea, I'd say after the, oh, uh, the last 30 years that High Power has been validating uh, medical devices, we've probably done over 50 tabletop sterilizers of all different shapes and sizes. So we have a lot of experience here uh, validating these for FDA clearance. ST55 is the standard that you would use for tabletop sterilizers. Once again, the sterile assurance level is 10 to minus 6. Okay. Maximum load claims, except for IUSS, <clears throat> lumens, size, quantity. You can also get a textile claim, okay? Uh, some dental facilities do uh, use quite a bit of uh, uh, cloths and linens. The next one for the dentals is the hand pieces. So the hand pieces are one of the most complex uh, devices to sterilize in the dental industry. Uh, they have uh, little turbines that spin in there. Everyone's gotten their, probably had a filling at some time or another. And we all know that high-pitched sound, that little whirling noise that you hear <laughs> from the dentist. Um, most likely that is a handpiece of some sort. Um, those do have channels through them also that are very small. Um, and so hand pieces are a very large piece of getting your tabletop sterilizer cleared if you want to claim hand pieces. Thermal profiles, once again, empty chambers, dry time validations, voidic tests if it's a dynamic air removal, and then of course the barrage of safety tests that would go along with that. So ethylene oxide, yes, we have validated those over the years. Um, once again, most of you probably thought ethylene oxide was a thing of the past. It's here to stay. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, if you've ever had an IFU that came through your central service department that had EO on there, you may be scratching your head. How am I going to do this? That's a great question, especially if you don't have it. You could, my suggestion is you could partner with another facility sometimes or find a contract third party reprocessor, which has ETO. Unfortunately, we don't do clinical devices here at IPAR. Um, Amy ST24 is the compliance standard for that. That also is under review now. Uh, it will be revised soon and updated, probably about a two-year process to do that. Once again, you have to prove your sterile assurance level 10 to minus 6 for each and every cycle that you're going to claim. Uh, thermal profiles, we also call that sterile uh, penetration testing, is also something that will be required. Um, the one that's interesting here uh, that's different than the rest is uh, residual testing, okay? That is... Uh, ethylene oxide residuals, of course, we know those are carcinogenic. So one of the tests you'd have to do is ISO 109 and 3 part 7 for ethylene oxide residuals. That is part of the biocompatibility standard or the ISO 109 and 3 series of standards for biocompatibility. As you can see, this is part 7. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's 18 or more parts in the standard covering all different things from uh, sensitization, irritation, center toxicity, and on. Are uh, there a number of safety tests that have to be performed when you're doing your ethylene oxide sterilizer testing? Um, one of the other things, too, that is new and emerging with this next bullet down is simulated use testing. Simulated use testing has been, um, and this also applies to vaporized hydrogen peroxide, simulated use testing is, is kind of a, it's been around a long time, but it's been uh, more uh, prominent with what's been going on with endoscopes in the industry lately, uh, with everything in the news with the endoscopes. Uh, we all know that. I'm assuming most of you know what's going on with endoscopes. But since that's happened, the simulated use testing has expanded. And what that is, is uh, it's another test where you ha actually have to inoculate um, these long channels and endoscopes, not only with the spores, but also artificial soil, which is... Uh, a 300 parts per million of AOAC water and some bovine serum. So it's kind of a what if test that the FDA has been asking. Um, that test uh, takes the spores, puts them in the artificial soil. Uh, the saving grace for that test is once you uh, put those spores and artificial soil in the, in the center of the channel of the scope, okay, 
um, you're allowed to use a full cycle to show that you have killed and eliminated all the spores, okay? So it is a full cycle that's used in there, but it's still called simulated use testing. So it's a unique one that's, that we've been seeing uh, more and more, not just for sterilizer manufacturers themselves, but also for just medical device manufacturers of endoscopes, okay? The next non-human factors testing. This is one that also is becoming more and more popular lately. Um, many sterilizers that are being cleared on the market today have to go through a human factor study, which uses a minimum of 15 participants to come in and uh, perform a number of tasks um, uh, based on the user manual of the sterilizer, okay? And what it's looking for, it's, you know, when you go through these motions, um, I like to think of like a clinical trial. It's almost like a mini clinical trial. And it's, it's looking for um, ambiguities in the IFU. So, you know, does the user understand what the IFU is saying, okay? So a lot of times these human factor studies can uncover um, little things that get missed by the user, okay? Or, you know, and then the, the uh, manual may have to be uh, revised to clarify. Another one's the AOAC test. <clears throat> I'm not gonna get into that one too much. Um, then you have your bacteriostasis and fungiostasis testing. Total kill endpoints, interesting. That's just showing that throughout your uh, sterilization cycle, uh, you do incremental um, uh, concentrations or incremental lethality, looking for when all of the organisms are eliminated. Uh, once again, we use a million, usually. Uh, the most common is we use a million spores uh, to get to our sterilization level of 10 to the minus six. Um, and in these tests, you would uh, not just run a half cycle, um, you would run maybe a quarter cycle, and then a half cycle, maybe even a three quarter cycle. But the the uh, the goal of this one is to see exactly at what point all the spores are limited. Okay. Uh, material compatibility, that's a big one. Uh, that can go for any modality. Uh, that's showing the different materials that are available on the market um, could withstand multiple repetitive cycles. Okay. Okay, and here we have uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Now, at this point in time, there is no perfect standard for vaporized hydrogen peroxide. The industry is working on one, uh, but the default standard today is ISO 14937, okay? Now, 14937 is not technically a sterilizer um, manufacturer's document, uh, but it does have very pertinent information in there that helps you validate the cycles that would be used in the hydrogen peroxide sterilizer. So once again, you can't get away without achieving a sterile assurance level of 10 to the minus six <clears throat> for each and every cycle claimed. Um, residual testing is, is, is uh, a little tricky in hydrogen peroxide. Um, a lot of people use, um, this says 109 and three part seven for ethylene oxide residuals. Uh, but a lot of people use an indirect test, 10993 part five, which is a cytotoxicity test as well as an indirect way of testing um, hydrogen peroxide because there's no perfect standard out there either for hydrogen peroxide residual testing. Uh, once again, that's in the biocompatibility standard series of ISO 10993. And of course, you still have to do all your safety testing uh, to prove the sterilizer safe <clears throat> while it's installed and operating in your central service department. Uh, once again, simulated use testing, very popular, um, especially if you're claiming you know, endoscopes with long channels in them. Uh, for some reason, the FDA seems to focus a lot with assimilated use testing on you know, scopes that have channels that are very small, usually below one millimeter or sometimes 0.7 millimeters. And that, that's when it really starts becoming a red flag to the FDA. Um, once you get down that small and you have channels upwards of you know, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 millimeters, um, that's when the FDA starts scratching their heads and saying, geez, you know, this is, these are difficult devices to clean. Therefore, we want to see these additional studies. Once again, human factor studies <clears throat> to demonstrate that the interface of these units, uh, the operating system, the touch screens, um, everything is uh, working appropriately and there's no confusion with the user. AOAC tests are also required. <clears throat> and then of course, your bacteriostasis, your fungiostasis, your total kill endpoint, and of course, material compatibility is a very big 
um, part of almost every sterilization process that's out there. Um, the newer technologies <clears throat> that come on the market, such as vaporized hydrogen peroxide, um, could be a little more prominent because the concentrations of the peroxide not only being injected in the chamber, but the concentrations of the peroxide um, after they've been injected in what we call chamber concentration um, really could have an effect on the different material in the process. That pretty much wraps up the validation testing uh, for a sterilizer. I wanna thank everyone uh, today. Uh, but I do want to apologize. I do not have a slide with my contact information, but I'd be more than happy uh, to provide that uh, as needed. And once again, thanks to all the Beyond Clean folks. You guys done a great job today, and I really appreciate being part of this. Yeah, thanks, Don. That was good. Uh, you know, I, I'll have to admit I'm not an expert by any means on the sterilizer side, and so that was pretty enlightening to see what goes into you know, all the various modalities, as you said. And um, so, yeah, I think we've got some good things to dive into here with a, with a discussion for the next 20 minutes or so between you, I, and Bobby, and got, got a number of questions from our audience. And uh, I got one from Dave DeGrossi, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout him hey, out. He's got, a <laughs> <laughs> He's got a really important one for you. So good, good, good. What trop like What tropical island is Don currently on, and did he make a <laughs> coconut-based craft beer? <laughs> oh, it's Friday, and I'm ready for a beer. <laughs> but uh, Dave, to answer your question, that I don't know. Where are we, guys? I know it's, it, was, it was one of the eight select virtual backgrounds that I could have selected for this. Oh, sure looks nice, though. Yeah, it certainly does. Well, and I think every you know on Friday, I think we're. We're talking, everybody's ready for a little little cocktail hour here coming up. Um, so, all right, well, let's get into the meat of this here. We've got a number of good questions. So I'll start off. Um, what is the ideal heat for ETO evacuations? Mm, you said heat? Yes, that's so a temperature question from said? our audience. Yeah, I guess that that would be a good interpretation. So, okay, so for the evacuation, uh, maybe we're talking aeration? Maybe, maybe aeration, I'm not sure. There is an aeration period after the cycle has completed. Typically, typically it's 55 degrees Celsius, but there are manufacturers that have lower temperatures. I don't know if that's what you're asking or not. You know, it's me interpreting an audience question. I think that that's probably a pretty good answer. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, Bobby, Bobby can weigh in on that a little bit if you'd like. We've also got some other questions we can hop into as well. Sure. Yeah, looking at sterilizer modalities, um, there is a growing popularity of uh, ozone in the low temperature sterilization market. Have you had any... Um, Hmm. done any work with an ozone sterilizer or have any comments on it as a sterilizer? Uh, what a great question. Without breaking any NDAs, I can tell you guys that, yes, I, earlier I mentioned how many <laughs> sterilizers have come through this lab over the years. They've, we've probably had a, at least 100 different sterilizers over the years, and, and I'll just tell you right now, probably only about 70 of those were able to be validated and cleared through the FDA. So what does that mean? That means, yes, there were other ones that just couldn't make the grade. Now, I'm not going to say anything like it was ozone or it wasn't. Um, but, um, yeah, there have been other modalities that have come through here. You, it's interesting some of the ones we've seen that, mm -hmm. um, that you know, most people think when they walk in the door here, it's the next best thing since sliced bread, and then we find out later that it can't even kill a, you know, one single spore. Um, so that's why yeah. you do the validations. Um, this is the right. perfect reason, you know, not everything makes the grade, <laughs> but, uh, ozone we have, how about this? Yes, we have seen ozone. We have seen ozone. Mm -hmm. And there, and okay. years ago, many of you may or may not know this, but a Sterizone had an ozone only sterilizer before it was hmm. converted to a, a dual sterilant sterilizer and, and, and the dual sterilant sterilizer today that's on the market, the Sterizone BP4 owned by Stryker, 
um, does have ozone in the cycle. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing some comments on that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know that there that I, I think when COVID started to interrupt all of our lives, I saw more in the way of ozone um, as far as sterilization, disinfection. That became more of a discussion o over the past year. Um, but uh, yeah, so another question here would be in your opinion, you know, there's, there's different types of sterilizers, right? Um, and good and bad, but do you have an opinion on the best modality or uh, mm -hmm. sterilizer in terms of price and <laughs> price and efficiency when it comes to Ooh. use in a sterile processing department? Well, <clears throat> try not to be biased here to anyone, but my first thought is this, <clears throat> you know, steam has been around for well over a century, maybe a century and a half. Um, I think from a per cycle cost point, it's probably the cheapest other than dry heat, right? Um, unfortunately, dry heat can't, you can't, you know, trying to have one on that large scale is very difficult, right? To have one as large as a, you know, a floor loader or something, right? Like steam. Um, from a cost point and throughput standpoint, I do believe steam is probably one of the cheaper. Uh, but but here's the reality, okay? <clears throat> the reality is this. The devices that are being manufactured today are becoming more complicated, more complex, new materials, electronics. Um, you know, with that said, that is the limitation to steam because those types of devices cannot go in steam. Um, so I think that is why the low temperature market is growing as fast as it is, okay? As devices become more complex, uh, as they become more intricate, um, steam just can't do the job on those types of devices, unfortunately. Right, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the devices or, that comes to mind is scopes, right? You know, you need to make sure I think drying is a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to scopes. Steam, to me, isn't probably the most mm -hmm. efficient way. Um, and so then you talk about efficiency. Um, you know, on the other side of the coin, maybe excluding price, what would you say in terms of efficiency is the best mm -hmm. in the market? Whew. And, and by efficiency, <laughs> you mean what like e ease of use like, um util from a utility use, standpoint yeah. okay easy use. i would say, listen from a utility standpoint i would say these hydrogen peroxide processes are great it's like one utility i mean you, you get a plug in a wall i mean how it doesn't get right. any easier than that right you just need electricity and the rest of it happens right so <laughs> um with steam you have all kinds of things going on right you got water pressure coming in you you know you may have um, house steam coming in. You have drains. Um, there's a lot of utilities there. And then the maintenance, too. It can get um, the pipes go bad and, and you know, stuff like that if you have bad steam quality. So I don't know. From an efficient, from a utility standpoint, I think these units that you just plug in the wall and go, plug and go, I mean, it doesn't get any easier. Now. So that from that, from that standpoint, those are probably very efficient. Um, you know, the smaller chambers... <clears throat> They may be smaller and the throughput smaller, um, but I think they you know they're running nonstop most of the time, right? And uh, right. the only problem is the consum the consumables are expensive. Okay, the um, the service contracts are expensive. And so you take a hydroperoxide service contract against a steam contract, and it's a night and day difference. So um, from that point, from a cost standpoint, of course, it's hard to compete with steam um, when you're dealing with um, oxidative agents that have to be shipped around the world, you know, and stuff like that. And the makeup and the chemical processing, and it's much more expensive from that standpoint. And yeah. I think too, from a safety and a toxicity standpoint too, with a lot of these chemicals out there, they're, uh, as you know, as we all know, uh, you can't smell a lot of them. So there's no real warning sign unless you have the chemical <laughs> indicator, you know, the indicators, um, so there's that to take into account too, as far as steam being yeah. a safer option when it comes to the chemistry involved. 
Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and once again, you know, ETO, um, you know, you usually need a whole room dedicated for it most of the time, right? So the real, that's a real estate issue, right? Now you're talking about the efficiency of real estate, right? So ETO probably takes up, I would, I would have to think the most real estate, but I could be wrong, um, um, followed by steam. Um, but then the hydrogen peroxide, very small real estate, you know, so if you don't have a lot of room in your CS department, maybe that's the way to go for you, right? It depends. It depends on your facility. Yeah. We've got a great question here from our crowd about um, just ongoing verification for sterility. So they want to know mm. what, uh, what your thoughts are on the difference between the standards for hydrogen peroxide and STEAM in terms of um, ongoing daily monitoring. So in hydrogen peroxide, <laughs> just using yeah. that type one um, indicator versus using a type five challenge pack or a type six challenge mm -hmm. pack in a, um, in a STEAM cycle. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a, a little bit of a difference between, you know, what's what's out there for STEAM. Remember, STEAM's been along so Steam's been around so long that, you know, most manufacturers have been able to develop all these different types of uh, verification products, right? So we've had a lot of time to do that. Um, you know, in the newer um, modalities like hydrogen peroxide, um, there's been less time to do that. Um, right now, because of the lack of standards out there for hydrogen peroxide, it's been a little slower going, okay? Um, so you, you're not, there's, I don't, I'm not aware of any anything other than a class one indicator for hydroperoxide. Like I said, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, um, the class ones are all that's out there right now for hydroperoxide. Yeah. We're having a hard enough try time trying to get a, a standard for hydroperoxide chemical indicator just for the class one, let alone class maybe twos or threes or whatever, or fives. Um, so someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all we have is class ones out there for chemical indicators. Now, the biologicals have come away a ways. Mm -hmm. um, lots of manufacturers are cross validating their BIs for other manufacturers, side and practice sterilizers. So you know, years ago, it could have been just one manufacturer. The only BI you can get, you had to get from that specific manufacturer, right? You couldn't get it from any other, anywhere else. But now um, there's a lot more flexibility in that area, right? So um, you're starting to see, you know, manufacturer ABI being able to be cleared by the FDA for manufacturer B sterilizer. So that's causing a little more flexibility in the market um, and solving some problems that some hospitals have had. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. It, it definitely is uh, peculiar from a technician standpoint, working in the field and kind of seeing that disparity in practices. Um, Thinking about sterilizers a little bit more in, in particular, as you're talking about this validation process and all that goes into it that happens in the lab setting, um, can you talk a little bit about validation in the user setting, like when a um, like a, mm. maybe an initial performance validation or an ongoing uh, validation, and if it does need to be revalidated in the field, how frequently does that type of thing need to take place? Yeah, I understand. So yeah, usually when you purchase the sterilizer from the sterilizer manufacturer, um, they come and do some type of installation. Um, a lot of times that installation would involve some type of either qualification or some small validation on the site after the sterilizer has been installed, right? Um, I do believe some of them uh, do run half cycles as part of their qualification before you can put this into use, right? So uh, each manufacturer does have their own qualification or installation protocols they use. They're not all the same. And I'm not aware of anything being standardized, to be honest with you. So each manufacturer is going to have their own um, protocol that they're going to use. Like I said, some do use half cycles. They come in, they run three half cycles. Everything's done during the installation qualification. If all the BIs are negative, you know, away you go. And, and you're up and running, and they allow you to start using the sterilizer. Now, Moving forward, you know, you've owned the sterilizer for two or three years now, right? So is there another validation that has to be um, required or, or done after X amount of time? Um, the answer the answer is no. There's no, not that I'm aware, is there, is there any regulatory that says you have to do that? Uh, but I do believe that some manufacturers may do uh, as part of their 
annual calibration or their annual PMs that they come in and do, uh, they may have some kind of chopped down uh, tests that they do just to show the sterilizer is still working properly. But it, it's all about the PMs that they do. Usually it's a six month PM and then maybe a year calibration or something. Usually, if they keep all that in checks and balance, all that in checks and balances going, in, in, in your sterilizers being serviced regularly and periodically, uh, typically, you know, another validation is not required. Now, one thing I didn't talk about, guys, is everything I talked about today was sterilizers that are marketed to healthcare. Okay, there's a whole nother um, product line of sterilizers that are out there for industrial use. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so manufacturers like uh, people who make single-use devices, right? Uh, a lot of you have these single use devices, they come in labeled sterile. Manufacturers could okay. install sterilizers in their part of their production pr process, okay? When they manufacture all these devices and they can do their own in-house sterilization. They don't need a healthcare 510K cleared sterilizer. They would use what we call a GMP sterilizer. Um, it's not cleared by the FDA, but all the testing you do in it has to be cleared through the FDA. So the FDA is right. one way or another looking at all, all that data. It just doesn't have to be a healthcare 510K cleared sterilizer. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good segue to this next question because being that we are seeing a lot more of single use devices in healthcare these days, um, what if anything is changing in the validation industry? Hmm. Well, so not much in the world of validating a sterilizer, but just validating medical devices themselves. Um, there has been um, a lot more scrutiny on, of course, I hope I talked about this this morning, cleaning, 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 cleaning. Um, when it comes to just validation in general, that seems to be the hot topic still, even after you know six years or so uh, being on the radar. Um, and of course, endoscopes. Um, there's not a lot of new tests that have come out. We're still using the, a lot of the similar tests we've done in the past. They've just kind of been modified a little bit. Um, other than that, biocompatibility seems to be another hot one for the FDA lately. Um, they never used to really enforce it as much as they are now, okay? So as a manufacturer, you may have a product line that has like six different colored, uh, they're all the same except, except you have a red product line, a green one, uh, for who knows what purposes, right? But now these colorants are really big with the FDA, um, and each colorant has to be assessed uh, independently. Years ago, you might have been able to pull all your colors together into one analysis, right? Now the FDA is saying, no, you can't do that. you got to do each one independently. So biocompatibility has been under the radar a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Cracking down on that. <laughs> yeah, I think that the process for a lot of just getting – getting anything through the FDA nowadays is, is time consuming and a lot longer than it used to be from what I've gathered from some of the manufacturers that I know in the industry. Gotcha. Oh, I do see uh, a, qu a question on here about earlier about the type. There is a type four. It looks like uh, somebody did mention that uh, 3M does have a type four indicator now. Very nice to know. Yep. Um, well, I think that we're getting close to time here, Don. And so I wanted to go ahead and uh, say thank you for joining us today on a Friday. Uh, I think it's time for that beer um, for you. <laughs> and we got one more coming up here. So everybody out there, please stick around with us. Um, okay. And if you have any additional questions, uh, Don had mentioned that he does not have his contact information on his slides but we do have it here on your side on the lower right-hand corner. So feel free to connect with him via email or LinkedIn, and he'll gladly follow up with you. As a reminder, there'll be a short 15-minute break before our last session, so please stick with us. It's going to be a good one. And we're really, once again, we're really, really glad you're here. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in 15. Thanks, folks.